Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Tuesday. It is 3 p.m. ET, and you have found us here on A Mighty Blaze on Crime Time, a special edition of Crime Time, because we have such a fabulous author that we needed to make a new time for him. So we are pleased that you are here today to join us for this special edition of Crime Time on A Mighty Blaze. I'm your host, Hank Philippi Ryan, the USA Today bestselling author of 13 going on 14 novels of suspense. My current book, Horrific Life, is casually displayed on the door behind me. And my new one, let me see if I have it here. Oh, I do. Is coming up in February. And you will laugh when you see this because when you see the book, the author and the book that we have today, you will realize how crazy the world of publishing is. But this is my new book, The House Guest, which comes out in February, which is sort of Gaslight meets Thelma and Louise and just got a rave Publishers Weekly review, which called me a master of suspense. So you can't do better than that. However, however, speaking of masters of suspense, the book we have today is The Guest House. So forgive me if I call it The House Guest from time to time. The Guest House by the fabulous Robin Morgan Bentley. And Lynn is here today saying hi, Robin. Um, which is, you all, it is out right now from Poison Pen Press. And it is, well, I don't want to say creepy, but it's surprising. It's chilling. It's sinister. I promise you, you will never see the end coming. Actually, you'll never see the middle coming. Or you'll actually never see the beginning coming. This is just a surprise at every turn in the book. And Robin Morgan Bentley is here today from the UK. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hank. So good to see you again. Go, good to see you too. And it's where it's 8 p.m. now. And I understand it's bedtime at your home. It is. Well, for, for, for my son anyway, yeah. Just, uh, just about managed to get him asleep at about... Uh, about seven or eight minutes ago, just in time <laughs> to join this. It was it was touch and go, but yes, I'm here and I'm excited. And it sounds like you're raising a reader. Yeah, God, I hope so. No, he does seem to like books. We've uh, we've just been reading some. Uh, we've been reading Rapunzel, which um, we were just talking about before, is one of the less dark fairy tales, but still quite dark. Um, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we all, they all seem to work. We write what we write, and certainly the guest house is dark, although. We're adults, so I guess we learn about suspense from a young age. Let me ask you quickly. I mean, it's interesting before we get to your marvelous book and a little bit more about you. When you are reading a story to your son, for instance, as an adult reading to a child, what do, what do you think about when you're, you know, you're sort of reading the story through your brain and imagining what his little brain is thinking? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um I always think you know, he's only two and he, he has this amazing thing that we as adults don't have, which is just only to live in the moment. Like he literally every page, he's just on that page. Um, and so I try to think about, you know, how is he experiencing this page? What pictures is he looking at right now? Um, you know, if I, if I ask him about, you know, what did you do earlier today? He might tell me a few things. Or what are you doing tomorrow? He might tell me a few things. But really, he's interested in what's going on right now. So as I'm reading a book to him, I'm trying to think, like, what's the thing he's looking at now? What's he focusing on right now? Um, rather than kind of thinking ahead. And that's a wonderful thing about being two years old, I think. You just uh, live in the moment. And you're reading him these stories, these venerable stories, um, that have lasted through seriously generations. You're, he's hearing them for the first time from you, right? Or well, or the fifth, sixth, seventh time. Oh, okay, um, okay. But, yeah. the first time but no, initially you're right. And and again, like what an what an amazing thing to be able to 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 experience the story for the first time. I I often think about that. I think I tweeted it once. Like if you could pick any book to just delete from your memory. And start all over again and 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 you know experiencing it all over again for the very first time what would it be and he gets to he gets to do this with these stories that are just like embedded within us but yeah he's experiencing them for the first time mm. so i can't resist though now asking what book you would read for the first time yeah i am um, i love a book I think I've mentioned this before but I love a book called Notes on a Scandal it was turned into a film um, with Kate Blanchett and Judy Dench um, and for me it's like a really 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 great quite early example of, a, of an unreliable narrator 
Um, I don't think it's a, yeah, I'd love to just. Um, What's it called again? Notes on a Scandal. Notes on a Scandal, huh? Yeah, by Zoe Heller. Um, it's about obsession, about uh, a woman that's obsessed with another woman. Um, and it's got this this chilling last line. And I love a chilling last line. And I wish I could n not know what that chilling last line oh, is. Oh, that's interesting. For the first time. Yeah. So, so a, a book in your genre, though, suspense. That's interesting. Not something yeah. that you read in high school or. Yeah, exactly that. Like, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And now all of you, when I look over here, you know that I'm looking at the comments. Now all of you are going to be thinking about what book you'd like to read for the first time. Again, I see Sherry Steuben is here. That's so marvelous. And Sherry Brown, all the Sherrys are here. And Lynn is here. And Diane, oh, this is so marvelous. And Susie and everybody is here. Hi, you all. To hear Robin Morgan Bentley uh, talk a little bit about the guest house. If you are new, if you are someone who is new to A Mighty Blaze, we send you a super welcome. For those of you who have been here before, an, an incredibly super welcome. We're so glad that you have joined us for now. We're almost to 100 episodes of Crime Time with Hank Philippi Ryan on A Mighty Blaze, and that is pretty amazing. That is just pretty amazing. If you go to the Mighty Blaze website, you'll be able to see a list of all the authors that we have had. And you can watch our shows on YouTube as well. But today, right now, today, we are talking to Robin Morgan Bentley about the guest house. You know, let me quickly remind you, though, that A Mighty Blaze was started a little bit more than two years ago at the beginning of the pandemic by the incredible powerhouse duo of Jenna Blum and Caroline Levitt to keep us all discovering new books. And here we are persevering as the pandemic wanes, we cross fingers and we will still keep talking about books. Let me keep talking as you're thinking, are you gonna let Robin talk? I'm going to in a minute as soon as I read his bio, which you need to hear. Robin Morgan Bentley was born and grew up in London after studying modern and medieval languages at Cambridge University, he went on to work for Google before moving to Audible, where he has been working since 2014. His debut th thriller, The Wreckage, was nominated for the CWA Dagger John Creasy New Blood Award. That is a huge deal, as you know. The Crime Fest Specsavers Debut Crime Award and Cap Capital Crimes Debut Book of the Year Award. He lives in Buckinghamshire with his husband and son who has just heard Rapunzel for the 45th time. <laughs> um, it's, I wonder if he thinks it's going to end differently another time. I think he likes the predictability. I think he, I think, you know, it's like a, it's a small win when you're a small person that, you know, you know he'll guess, he knows what's going to happen on the next page and he sort of anticipates it. And um, I think if I changed the ending, he'd, he'd start, he'd start shouting at me. <laughs> well, speaking about guessing what's going to happen on the next page, really, Robin, the guest house is um, really haunting and quite riveting. And I want to talk to you about family and marriage and motivation and secrets. But first, tell us a little about the book. How would you describe it? What genre? And tell us sure. a little bit about the story. So it, it, it's a psychological thriller, a domestic thriller um, about a, a couple, Jamie and Victoria, they're expecting their first baby, um, kind of pretty late into the pregnancy, they decide to go on a trip uh, just to kind of decompress, they lead sort of busy lives with work and, and, and family and, you know, they've got a baby coming in and they thought, let's just get out of let's get out of town um, and decompress and go somewhere super, super remote um, um, for a couple of days and they check in to a guest house um, which is in the North Pennines which is kind of as north as you can get in England before you hit Scotland beautiful very isolated um, setting uh, they're greeted by an older couple Barry and Fiona who uh, run the guest house and also live there um, and they greet them and they seem perfectly nice and they give them dinner and they check in um, and they go to bed and then the the first morning um, after uh, they've checked in, uh, they wake up and everything isn't quite right. Uh, their car has disappeared, their keys have gone, all the doors are locked, their phones have disappeared, and Victoria starts to feel her contractions coming along. Um, and, and so what you get in the book is a kind of split timeline between what's happening in this terrible um, night in the guest house, or morning in the guest house, and then six weeks on when Jamie and Victoria are back in their in their in their lives back in London uh, without without their child um, and 
I'm trying to piece together their lives and what, what, what really happened in the guest house. I mean, it, so much to unpack there because you've taken this sort of trope, I don't like to use that word, but I guess it's evolved into being okay to say, of the locked room, locked mansion, isolated mystery, um, and completely changed it, completely made it different. I mean, I your readers are smart. Um, and when I started reading the book, I sort of thought, oh, I know what this is. And it's chilling and creepy. And everything that you just said pretty much happens in chapter one. So nothing is given away. And they gradually in chapter one begin to realize, as you said, their car is gone and their keys are gone and the windows are locked. And you learn, let me just say in this first chapter, the relationship between these two people and the couple. Talk a little bit about that and how you use that first chapter, not only for plot, but for relationship. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think a book like this has to start with character. Um, and so you get to meet a couple um, in, you know, a kind of key point of their marriage. Um, and you, um, you, 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 I think from the very outset, get an idea that maybe their marriage isn't ideal and that there are things that they need to deal with within their marriage. Um, and that there's a bit of a power imbalance. Um, and um, you know, people aren't necessarily telling the truth the whole time. So I think immediately you, you kind of um, get a sense of these two characters and um, maybe they play against gender stereotypes a little bit in some cases. Um, maybe um, maybe they say some things that might come across as quite uh, Victorian in particular and says some things from the outset that uh, seem quite cold. Um, um, but yeah, you, from the outset, you, you get the impression that these two have, have, got, have got issues in their marriage. When you start reading this book, you all, and if you just joined us, we're talking about The House Guest by Robin Morgan Bentley. Um, it's this chilling beginning to an even chilling, more chilling story. But I wonder, as you're writing this book, how you're feeling about the relationship of the characters. And you were saying that it's all about character, but how important was it to you? And how much fun was it for you to sneak in these clues to who the characters really are and what they care about and how they behave in reaction to what's happening to them? Uh, yeah, think? it's really fun. I think one of the things I enjoy most about writing is is is, is little bits of comedy um, when I'm drawing the characters. And I think, you know, um, they both, and not just Jamie and Victoria, but there are some other peripheral characters that say some unusual things and do some unusual things and um, behave in unpredictable ways. There's a dinner party scene about of a third of the way into the book where, and I always think a dinner party scene is a really good mechanism uh, to just kind of, for a bit of light relief, it, well, both kind of can move the plot on quite a lot because you've got people around the table talking and drinking sometimes and that can lead to revelations. And um, so I love throwing in like little bitchy remarks basically and, 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 and things like that. Um, yeah, I love, I, well, it, it's an honor, right, as an author to get to kind of be someone else or to be a few other people um, for a bit and, and play around with other people's thought processes and how they might um, react to certain um, situations. It feels like a game um sometimes you know that you, you get to play and, and hopefully get paid for it so um uh yeah no i love it that's what i love I mean, that's so interesting that, to hear you say that because you do sort of inhabit each character and each point of view mm. you have to and you have to sort of be the ones the characters whose point of view you're not in because you need to know what they're thinking and what why right. they do what they do how do you do that how do you sort of become a character um when you write and who which characters were the most engaging for you to write and which were the difficult ones? Yeah, well, so elements of Jamie were, were very easy for me to write. Um, there's a, a, a key part to Jamie is that he has cerebral palsy, he has a disability and it's the same disability that I have. And so I was able to draw on a lot of kind of very specific experiences that I have um, when writing this character. And it was kind of quite cathartic and therapeutic in some ways to be able to just um, put those details in. Um, I had a lot of fun writing Victoria, but then I also felt quite a lot of pressure um, 
to to get it right you know i am a, i am a, a man um uh writing uh, a female character in in the case of this book it's a very female experience it's about pregnancy it's about childbirth i felt a lot of responsibility um to to, to try and represent her in a way that felt authentic um so i spent a lot of time talking to women and people in my life um, who have experienced pregnancy and childbirth and that kind of thing to try and really um, bring some authenticity to it. I was very conscious of doing that. So it was both fun and also challenging, I think, to write that character. Yeah, let's talk about both of those things, the, the pregnancy first, because it is audacious, someone might think, um, for you to talk about what it feels like to give birth. Um, but yet, it really came through as incredibly authentic. How do you, how did you do that? Besides talking to people? I mean, I know you talk to people and it's, you know, clearly real sounding, but um, did it open your eyes at all to anything? Well, totally. I mean, simultaneously, as I was writing this, I also became a dad and, and my husband and I came, became dads through surrogacy. And so we're particularly close to um, our friend Rachel, who who carried our son and, and gave birth. And so spending a lot of time with her, you know, being there for the birth um, and really, I, you know, the first one of the first drafts I wrote, um, and my editor said, rewrite the birth scenes after you've seen it happen and after you've been there and you've, uh, and you've experienced it. I think it will become more authentic. Um, and I think it did. Uh, I did a lot of reading as well. I spent a lot of time on the internet just reading um, lots of accounts of different, um, you know, different physical sensations, um, um, which... I've never experienced myself, but are uh, described really eloquently by women on the internet who talk passionately and describe vividly their experiences of giving birth and of labor and of pregnancy. So yeah, I did a lot of research and um, I was also lucky. There's a woman called Leah Hazard who um, is a, a midwife in the UK, but she's written a best-selling kind of memoir called Hard Pushed, which is um, about the experience of being a memoir and how, how how broken the health services in the UK largely. Um, and I spent a lot of time with her um, talking things through and getting kind of authenticity checks and things like that. But yeah, you're right. It was really audacious. And I actually don't you know. know. But I can't imagine that in the response was anything but completely positive. I mean, it's just so good. Yeah, well, thank. Uh, yeah, I think, I think also the other thing to say that I really found is that every woman's experience is different. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 there's no one way, there's no one experience. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure some women read it and be like, you know, I just wasn't, I was in way more pain. That's not how my pain felt at all. Or that's not how I felt emotionally at all. But um, I think in a way, you know, it's so disparate, the experience that sure. um, this is just one account. Um, I mean, it's not, a, the, your book isn't about everybody. It's about right. this particular character and, and what happened to her. The thing about pregnancy in, in a book like this, um, it also makes your character be... And, and Jamie, too, the husband, be so vulnerable mm. because, because now it's not just about the two of them. Totally. There's, um, there's a, a kind of quote at the beginning of the book that I took from A, a Little Life, which is a book that I really... Um, I'll say I really enjoyed it. It's, it's a hard read, but it's... Uh, um, and the quote, I'm going to get it now, actually. I'm going to get it exactly, but it's... Um, You've never known fear until you have a child. And maybe that's what tricks us into thinking it's more magnificent because the fear itself is more magnificent. Every day your first thought is not, I love him, but how is he? The world overnight rearranges itself into an obstacle course of terrors. And this idea of becoming a parent just raises the stakes in every way. Like everything that you thought was scary before is irrelevant. Um, um, and that's what I think that's what a, a, a successful psychological thriller is. It's about people in jeopardy, people in vulnerable situations. So, yes, putting my characters in this situation makes it make, make just raises the stakes significantly. Right. But 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 because you write psychological suspense and because we as readers understand that, of course, that's what you would do. Your job that you handled so gorgeously in the guest house is to take all of those things and then sort of turn it. I don't know if we can even talk about this, but sort of turn all that on its head um, to make it still be unexpected. 
Um, Sherry was saying earlier that she never saw the ending coming and we won't talk about that because of course you don't see the ending coming because it's a Robin Morgan Bentley book so you're not going to but did you know the end before you got there or did it evolve? It definitely evolved I think um, it's funny because I'm sort of writing another book now and I've got a much clearer sense this time of, of, of what the big 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 twist at the end is um, I think when I was writing the guest house, I kind of knew, I knew which characters to trust and which not to trust, um, mm -hmm. and that what, yeah, kind of the vague direction of the big revelation. But then, uh, for me, one of the most exciting things about writing is 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 surprising myself as I'm going as well, and that's really exciting. And Hank, I don't know if you ever have the same, but when you're writing and you suddenly think, oh, actually, maybe I can put it in that do it in that direction rather than the other keeps it keeps it interesting as a writer. I, I, I don't think I'll ever be a, a writer that has every scene plotted out um, before I start because I think then it becomes, then I lose some of the, the fun in writing. And, um, I, you know, my, my editor always asks me, and some of you know, oh, my goodness, we have so many more people, and thank you for these wonderful questions, and we will get to them at the end of the show. So nice to see you all. My editor has said to me from time to time, can you just send me an outline of what your book is going to be? And I say, well, no, you know, I, I really can't because I, and I, and I know you'll understand this, Robin. I say, I don't know what happens until it happens. And it doesn't happen until it happens in the book. I can't force it to happen. I can't force it to happen quickly. Sherry says, that's what makes a great book is the big surprise at the end and twist and turns. But I agree, Sherry, that's so true. But in, in really good books like The Guest House, those twists and turns happen throughout. So you're, you're, we know as thriller readers that we're kind of, there's going to be something, but it's the middle, you know, those middle twists that you do so, so gorgeously. So yeah, the, I surprise myself all the time. And Sue Grafton used to call that the magic of writing that, mm. you know, you're writing along and somebody will knock at the door and I'm like, really? Somebody's at the door? Who? And you open the door and you think, what? You know, I didn't know this was going to happen. So enough about this. Enough about me. Let's go back to, let's go back to the guest house. Um, the other element that you, that you said that was important to you was the cerebral palsy aspect of, of Jamie and how he deals with that. And there's a poignant moment near the, you know, like on page two or something, when someone says to him, what happened to your leg? Mm. Um, and throughout there are moments like that that are touching and poignant where he has to react. Talk a little bit about that. And Yeah, definitely. That. So uh, one of the reasons I wanted to write this character, I'd never, I'd never really come across a character in a thriller or really in fiction before with a disability like mine. Um, I think I, it's very, if you look kind of back historically at, at books and at films and TV shows, often the disabled characters are they're not 3D, they're not realistic, they are, they're some, very often they're the villains. If you think about Bond films, for example, mm -hmm. you know, often a Bond villain will have a disability, or if not a villain, they're someone to be pitied. Um, and that's not how I feel as a disabled man. I, you know, I, I, I'm not a villain, but I'm also not someone looking for pity. And um, so I wanted to write a kind of more three-dimensional character where disability is part of his identity. It kind of, you know, it, it is relevant to some aspects of the plot, but, e but equally it's incidental. Um, and that was important to me. Yeah, and so um, I often talk about um uh like the spectrum of of um of hidden disability um and how um often i feel like i have to come out as disabled and most days i have to come out as disabled to um to someone in the street because you know i don't use a wheelchair i walk with a limp but it's a limp that you could miss if you're not focusing on it or you know if i'm you know if i'm not walking alongside somebody and i'm just you know I don't know, if I go to meet someone at a restaurant and we're just talking to each other, they might not notice it. Um, so that you, you get a lot of that in, in, in Jamie, this idea of having to come out as disabled and having to um, explain yourself and misconceptions about pain and things like that. I wanted to, I wanted to get across. So two things about that. And you were saying that it was cathartic for you. Um, talk mm. a little bit about that, if you will. And then talk also about how you hope to change the reader as a result of that. Yeah, sure. So I think it's 
um, it was it it was a moment of reflection for me to be able to write this character and and be able to kind of I mean just the very fact that we're having this conversation is a really good thing for me and, and my mental health. You know, I think um, there's a tendency when you when you when you grow up with a disability to hide it um, or to try and overcome it. Um, and actually, what I've learned in the writing process of writing Jamie and, and talking about it all the time when I'm talking about the book is 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 to embrace it and not to be um, afraid of it. And so, by being able to write this and write these aspects, I've I've kind of been very open and and it's just there and it's in a published book that's in shops and my all my friends have read it and there's no you know there's no more there's no more hiding about it which has been good and then I think in terms of changing um changing perceptions I think um yeah this idea of um this idea of disability being a spectrum and um it not being you know a, dis a disabled person I want someone to read this and realize that um, a disabled person, uh, disabilities can manifest themselves in lots of different ways. It doesn't need to define someone completely. Um, and, you know, maybe little tips about what you what you might and might not say to a disabled person that might offend them. You might pick some of that stuff up. If you yeah. don't, that's also fine. If you just want to read a thriller, that's also fine. <laughs> and you do it with such a gentle, light hand. You know, you're yeah, seeing the so. word Jamie and we're hearing, it, we're hearing it through Jamie's reaction to it. And we begin to feel connected to the awkward things that people say and hear mm. them in a, in a different way. Um, yeah. And again, it's, 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 it's important to the story, but it isn't the story. And I think you handled that. You handle it very deftly. Um, and mm. I'm, I'm eager and Sherry saying that that is good. Let's go on to this house. I mean, if I, I got to tell you, Robin, if I saw this house, I wouldn't, I'm not quite sure I'd say, Oh, that looks fun. Mm. Let's go, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. About, is that a real place and how that place developed? So it's, yeah, well, yes and no. So I, um, my husband and I stayed in a, in a place called Garagil, which is the place where it's set. Um, it was a much smaller house than the one that's described. Um, but yeah, I mean, yes, it was in the middle of nowhere. It, we kind of, we, we stayed there for New Year. It was very cold. When we kind of approached, it was it shrouded in mist, um, the mountains behind it. Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, there are literally places like that in the UK. And this idea of being able to look out of the window and you literally can't see another house. I think people think of the UK as being small. And it is small compared to the US, but there are areas that are really, really sparsely populated where there are just odd houses here and there. And, you know, not to overuse the cliche, but if you screamed, no one would hear because you are in the middle of nowhere. Um, so, yeah, it's realistic to a certain extent. The whole uh, one light being on um, it's particularly creepy, and I haven't experienced that myself with all the lights. I just want off. you to see this again, you all. One yeah. light going on, and nothing around it. No roads. Mm. Not to mention no hospital, no phone, no, right. no anything. That feeling of just being alone at one of the most vulnerable, critical times of your life is a really, really chilling book. The Guest House by Robin Morgan Bentley. I'm wondering, as we as we're getting closer to the time of asking questions, um, because of your connection with audible mm -hmm. and because of the massive popularity of audiobooks um how does knowing that someone is going to be reading your book out loud and that a reader is going to be hearing it instead of reading it how does if it does how does that affect how you write it it affects it massively it's a big a big part of the editing process more than anything is is me reading it out loud. Um, this book and my first book and the book I'm writing, they're all written in various first persons, uh, in the first person. So, you know, it alternates between chapters, but it's always like, I am doing this, I am feeling this. Um, and I think that works particularly well in audio. You've got someone in your ear telling you their inner thoughts. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely have a predilection for writing in the first person because I'm always thinking about audio. And then yeah, one of the last things I do before I hit send to my agent or editor is read it all out loud um, because I know I've seen it happen um, when actors get into the studio with books, when, when they're reading it out loud, when they're performing it and something doesn't sound right or dialogue particularly sounds awkward or 
actually oh, this is not how a person would talk mm-hmm. hearing it out loud hearing an audiobook really exposes that so it's a it's advice i give to writers whether or not they're interested in audio editions or not it's just read your book out loud as a as a as a as a part of the editing process because you'll hear if something sounds unnatural or repetition is really it becomes yes. really obvious when you read things out loud and, and other things like that i i will confess that um there's a there's a there's a there's a gizmo on my word software that will read it out loud to you. Oh, nice! Computer yeah. voice, and I do that all. I listen to it all the time, and every day when I start writing, I listen to the previous couple of pages out loud to sort of get me back into the book. Um, and you're so right about the repetition or unintentional rhyme or awkward phrasing. Mm. The other thing about audiobooks that, that's really changed my life, and I thank you all for this, is that I realized that at the beginning of a chapter, it's, it's so critical to ground the reader in where you are. So, because the movie in your mind has to start. You know right. what I mean? I know exactly what you mean. And I think that, I think that, kind of applies to whether you're reading or, or, or listening. You know, um, you're asking a lot of a reader, I think. You're asking them to come away from their lives and go to this this place. And you, want it, you, you, you don't want to make it too hard for them. You don't want it to be hard. You know, I think particularly a book like this or a, the books that we write, you know, you want it to be a, a, a route to relaxation, a route to being able to switch off from... You don't want them to work too hard to figure out, hang on, Who's talking? Where am I? What's going on? You need to you need to do certain things as a writer to help the reader, and the bit that they need to figure out is the twist and the mystery. That's that's your job. But don't um, I think totally making sure you're starting each chapter and people know who's talking, where they are, what day it is, what time it is, which of the different timelines it is is really important because there's I, I as a reader if I'm confused particularly early on if I don't know where I am it, it turns me off and you in a, in a physical book you can turn the page back and say who is that guy where, where is this right but in an audio book it's relentlessly forward and if you get right. lost you're lost and I also think the other thing with an audiobook is that often when I, when people listen to audiobooks they're doing something else at the same mm-hmm. time which means that they might not be concentrating to the same extent um, so I think it's, 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 you know, if you think about if you're holding a physical book, your eyes are occupied, you're, you're much more focused on it. If you're listening to a book, you might be um, also commuting or also cleaning or doing something else. Um, and so in audio, you have to you, ha- you have to expect that the person listening isn't as maybe as focused as if they were reading the physical book. So fascinating. I just love yeah. it. And I think the, the rise of audiobooks is phenomenal. The idea that we can now have it in our heads. You know, the book reverberates and the voices reverberate in our heads and mm. the stories do too. And that's great. My final question, and then we'll go to questions from the audience. Did you always want to be a writer? Is, is this are you is this a fulfillment for you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I yes and no. I, I've never been the kind of um, person who said I, I will write a book one day and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And I hadn't, you know, I was lucky. I hadn't. I, you know, I, I wrote um, my first book and sent it to an agent, and I was lucky, and they wanted to, you know, it led to being published. Um, but it hasn't been, you know, I've always been someone who's liked making up stories. I think I can. I've got this memory of being a kid at primary school and being really excited when it came, we were writing these radio plays and um, being really excited when the teacher said, okay, it's time to work on our radio plays. And um, I, that's a really early memory at school for me. And I've always been someone to kind of do impressions of other people and, to, um, you know, be really into, I, I, I love consuming stories, whether that's books or films or theater or TV. So stories have always been a real, um, a real passion of mine. Yeah. I won't ask you to do an impression, but do you remember, do you remember what, um, any of those radio plays were that you wrote as a kid? Yeah, I remember one called, it was uh, ridiculous. It was called The Imposter Queen um, about a little boy who um, was masquerading as the Queen of England, um, riding around um, and had the, you know, the Queen was, I think the Queen was ill and needed someone to help out. And so this little boy who dressed up as the Queen and did all the Queen's duties while the Queen was unwell. Um, yeah. 
That's so cute. And that would work yeah. on the radio, right? Because the, your disbelief gets suspended. If they, if the other people buy it, then why not have a little boy be, be the queen? And yeah, I you know what, if, if, you know, maybe if I decide, maybe I should, uh, maybe I'll give it a go as a kid's book one day, you know, who knows, but uh, I, I wish idea. I could find the, uh, yeah, it's, it's fun. Also lots of, um, lots of, F good feeling about the uh, the queen at the moment, and you know, reminiscing and that kind of stuff. So. And it's it's a very sweet little story. It, mm. it definitely is. Let me sneak in one more question from me, and that is, you said you said you were working on something else. Can you give us some idea of what that is? Yes, yeah, so it's another psychological thriller um, about um, uh, in the UK. There are there are a few a handful of people who have. Um, who are living under new identities because they committed terrible crimes when they were children. Um, and so this thriller looks at uh, a man who is living a life, relatively kind of traditional life with his wife and child. Um, and his big secret is that when he was a child, he killed someone um, and went through um, correctional facilities and was given a new identity by the government um, and his new family, his current life, no one in his current life knows his big dark secret um which um is obviously a wild scenario but one that is that is real and there are literally people living in the uk in that scenario so. that seems very possible to me mm. so, but yeah. the idea of I, I don't know maybe i'm a i'm an oversharer I, I don't have any secrets from my, from my <laughs> the idea of having oh, this massive... big enough that you want to keep right yeah maybe right, I don't, I mean, I you, you're so good at motivation you just right? need to give someone the motivation to mm. Keep it. Robin, you are amazing. And we have been talking about the house guests. And while we wait for your new book to come out, all of you, not right now, but when this show is over, run, run, run and get The Guest House by Robin Morgan Bentley. It is chilling and it is so surprising and it is so gorgeously written. Um, really, really wonderful book on the front. It says, keep your family safe, whatever the cost. Bum, bum. Let's take some questions from the audience, but I really enjoyed that. I honestly could not put this down. I couldn't, um, I couldn't figure out what was going to happen. And I think I'm so good at that, but you completely, you completely fooled me. And Sherry is saying, how do you get your mindset? Oh, what a good question. To write a suspense book like The Guest House. I, uh, I think I've got quite a kind of dark imagination. Um, and I'm often often you know it doesn't take me that like there's a very specific place in my house where I write right here um I often like to write when it's dark outside I think that helps a lot um yeah it doesn't take me that long but I kind of have to get into a bit of a zone um no distractions um and you know in the right place um and yeah but you know um not every day is a writing day, as I'm sure, Hank, you have the same, you know, some days are really great, some days nothing's, you know, nothing comes, and so you have to um, wait for the wait for the inspiration. Yeah, well, some days I just say to myself, just write anything, you can fix it later, right? That's, the, that's the best thing, that's, yeah, that's the best way to do it. We're talking about The Guest House by Robin Morgan Bentley, and I completely forgot that there's a giveaway, so leave a question or a comment or general accolades for Robin in maybe the five minutes that we have left, leave a question, and you will be entered to win on the Wheel of Fun from Poison Pen, The Guest House by Robin Morgan Bentley. Sherry is asking, how do you celebrate a new book being released? Good question. Great question. Um, so, uh, a little party, firstly, um, my, when my first book came out was in, in February, 2020, um, beginning of February, 2020, and obviously the pandemic, um, really hit in March, 2020 in the UK. So I had a big, like, uh, lots of my friends came, it was my first book, I had a big book launch. Um, and then that was like the last social event for a lot of my friends for a long while, cause we all went into lockdown. So a nice little party, um, and um, yeah, you know, a glass of a glass of something fizzy and sparkling. So for your next book, you can maybe you crossing fingers, you can do that as well. Maybe the world will be a little bit more in equilibrium. Yeah, my for, for so for the guest house in the UK, I did something outside because we were able to do like we went to a nice pub with an outside um, venue, which was just a few people. Um, so it was kind of yeah, but hopefully um, the world will anyway. It's a very small small thing, but um, but you know fun yeah. no no it's it's nice to finally have that moment do you type the end when you're finished write, writing a book absolutely it's the <laughs> biggest joy 
Oh, that, that is what you live for. Um, that, that moment when you write the end. Yeah, I love that moment. That's a great answer. That's what you live for, the moment when you write the end. Yeah. Um, Mary Garrett is asking, um, did you move some of your actual fears into your book? Was it therapeutic? Mm, really good question. I guess so. I guess so. Right. Um, it's funny how long a, a book takes to write. So, or, you know, um, you, you come up with the idea and by the time I actually, you know, I, I'd written my first book um, and, and I'd met an agent and my agent was like, okay, what's your idea for your next book? And I was kind of taken aback and that's where the idea came. And there's quite a long gap between that and actually the book being written. So I became a dad in that period. So I guess, yeah, of course, you know, I was becoming a, I, I'd become a dad um, at the same time that I was writing this. And there's definitely my own fears um, in this. And, you know, um, I think it helps sometimes to, you know, write terrible things happening in books or read about terrible things happening in books because it makes everyday anxieties in, in real life seem trivial, right? Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I realized it's always safe inside a book. So mm. you can write. And Stephen King, wasn't it the one who said, um, write what you fear? It's not about, you don't, you don't, it's not write what you know, it's write what you fear. And that seems to have worked for you. I think we have one last question that was just, what, uh, what, oh, darling, that's so funny. What author other than Hank would you like to collaborate with if given the opportunity? That's a, that's a great question. Well, so, that, so there's an author called Fiona Barton. I think um, you may be familiar with her. And she was just a real inspiration for me. Um, I I met her while I was working, you know, years ago at Audible when she was bringing out her debut and we had a conversation and I said, oh, I've got this idea. And she said, do it, just do it, you know, write, stop talking about it, just write your first page. Um, and she, uh, she's she been a real kind of, um, I really thank her a lot for kind of pushing me there. I think she's a brilliant suspense writer uh, who I have a lot to learn from and I would love, you know, one day if she... Yeah, yeah. I don't know. How do you write a book together with someone? Is that a thing? Maybe, maybe a short story collection or something. Oh, that's it. Yes, Fiona Barton is a wonderful person to have as a mentor and guide. Mm. Incredibly mm. talented. Incredibly talented. Mm -hmm. Fiona Barton. Tell. I can't remember that. Her book that I remember was the something. The widow oh, was her debut. Widow. Yeah. Okay. I can see it, but I couldn't. My poor brain had it. Yeah. Shorted out. The Widow. Yeah, the the widow. Yeah. And today we're talking about The Guest House by Robin Morgan Bentley. And are you ready? We will spin the wheel of fun to see who wins a copy of The Guest House. I always think we should have music. And the winner is... Ah, no, we can't win. <laughs> it shows you that it, that it would that it's totally random. It's totally random. I love the confetti, but but let's spin that again, Karen, in the back room and see if we can get a reader winner. And you're not going to you're not getting my copy. You're Sherry Brown. No, Susie Baldwin, Lynn Hanman. Lynn. Lynn Hanman wins, and I think she asked the first question of the day, so that seems great. So, Lynn, you will get instructions about how to email me, and we will send you via Poison Pen Press. Thank you, darling, Poison Pen, uh, a copy of The Guest House by Robin Morgan Bentley. Robin, if you'll stay there for one second, I want to come back and say goodbye to you, but I want to say to you all who are watching, do not move or else move and come back in about 10 minutes because our usual time for crime time is 4 p.m. ET. And we will be here, of course, at 4 p.m. ET with a completely different kind of book, um, Blackmail and Babinka by Mia Manansala, um, which is a cozy mystery. So couldn't be more different from the chilling, scary, the guest house to Blackmail and Babinka by Mia P. Manansala. And we will talk about that. Adorable, charming, and really, a really good mystery in about 10 minutes. But at, by till then, Robin, thank you so much for being, I don't want to cover up your name, being with us this afternoon, this evening here in the UK. Um, I, we've had a wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Great questions. And it's always lovely to talk to you, Hank. Thank you. Of course. My pleasure. And yes, you're right. They were really they were really exceptionally good questions. All of you, thank you. We have enjoyed speaking with you this afternoon. And I hope you will come back at 4 o'clock today for our regularly scheduled time on Crime Time. If you can't, though, ooh, let me show you this. Next week at 
four, books, books, books. Have you read this, Robin? Next week at four, Luca Vest. I have. I've read. I I know him, but I haven't. Um, yeah, I haven't read that one. So I can't wait to read it. You Never Said Goodbye by Luca Vest. And we will be here next week at four to talk to you about this with uh, Luca himself. And it says on the cover, the day she died was only the beginning. You Never Said Goodbye next week at 4 p.m. ET here on Crime Time. So we will see you at four o'clock today. And we hope at four o'clock next week. Until then, remember, it is always safe inside a book. And we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.